Go ahead and take a seat, and uh, as you're doing so, grab your Bible or your device, your app, whatever you read the Bible on, and I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Hey, if you don't know where Matthew chapter 5 is at, uh, it's about two-thirds of the way uh, into the Bible. Uh, You're going to be looking for four names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, If you're in some weird-sounding names like Micah or uh, uh, Habakkuk or anything like that, you haven't gone far enough. And if you're in any of the ones that end in I-A-N-S, like uh, 1 Corinthians or anything like that, you've gone too far, you need to back up. And if I've totally confused you, close your Bible, open it to the very front to the table of contents and look for Matthew there. So if you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles under the chairs. You can just reach down and grab one from uh, down there. And if you don't have a Bible at home, grab one of those Bibles from under the chair and at the end of the service, tuck it under your arm and walk out the door with it because we want every person to have a Bible that they can read and refer to and study day in and day out at their house. Uh, So consider that uh, your gift from us. Now, um, obviously, we've uh, got some decorations up here, so we're talking about some different things. We started a new series last week, uh, Building a House of Faith, Um, and uh, Chad started last week talking about the formal living room. Uh, If you weren't here last weekend, I encourage you, uh, go onto our website, calvarylhc.com, and go watch that sermon. Uh, It was a great sermon. Uh, even for Chad, <laughs> so I joke. Um, he knows I stab at him every so often, but uh, go check out that message because seriously, it was an excellent message and you can gain a lot out of it. Now today we're talking about the kitchen and I'm gonna start out with a, probably one of the most eventful stories that has ever taken place with me in a kitchen. I have a scar on my wrist right here uh, that my watch band covers up. You wanna hear how I got this scar? <laughs> Basically, here's what happened. It was seven years ago. Knox was about two months old. Um, It was a Sunday, and I'm sure Chad had preached about loving your family or being a good husband or something. I have no idea. But uh, Jana went into the kitchen to do the dishes. Uh, And me, being the perfect husband that I am, uh, decided to go help her. And so I was rinsing and drying dishes with her. And we're sitting there chit-chatting. And um, I was drying a glass. And I don't know about you, but uh, I was taught you take the towel and you kind of wring it a little bit and you put it inside the glass. And then you turn it to wipe the inside because your hand is maybe too big to get inside the glass itself. And so I had taken this rag and I had put it down into the glass and I was turning it. And then I had grabbed the outside to wipe the rim of the glass itself. And as I grabbed and pushed, the glass shattered in my hand. And mind you, I'm pushing. And so at that moment, it shattered and one of the shards went into my wrist right here. Not a good place to cut yourself deep, right? And so my wife, luckily, is in the medical field and knew exactly what to do. She was like, okay, lay down, take a towel, push it against here. I'm gonna go get Knox. Mind you, Knox is a two-month-old who is napping. Worst case scenario, right? I'm gonna go wake a two-month-old from a nap. And so she goes into his room. He is screaming bloody murder. He is furious that we've woken him up from his nap. And so she comes back out and she is in care mode. Okay, I'm gonna go put Knox in the car and then I'm gonna come get you and we're gonna drive to urgent care. And so she's moving super fast. And okay, I'm laying on the floor with a towel on my wrist. So she gets me in the car, we drive to urgent care and it's the urgent care that's right across the street from the hospital. Awesome place. But their parking lot is one of the smallest parking lots in all of Havasu. And so we pull into the parking lot and literally every parking space, including the two handicapped places, are filled with cars. Now at this point, I'm doing this in the passenger seat and I'm about the color of a sheet of paper. And so Jana looks over and says, get out, go inside, go ahead and get checked in. I'm going to drive around to the back and I'll meet you inside. Okay. Okay. And so I get out and I walk into the urgent care facility and this very kind woman behind the counter looks at me and says, yes, how how can I help you? And I say these words exactly. Yes, I just slipped my wrist. (laughs) I was anemic, okay? Give me a break. 
But the fact is, that's probably the last thing you should ever say to someone sitting behind the counter of a medical facility. I just slipped my wrist. And so the lady behind the counter goes, excuse me, you slit your wrist? And luckily, at that exact moment, Jana comes walking in with Knox and goes, whoa, 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 that's not what happened. And so she goes on to explain what happened. Long story short, they got me back. They got me all stitched up. Uh, I'm still alive. I'm fine. But I have this little scar here as a result. That was one of the most exciting things that has ever happened to me in a kitchen. Now, what did I learn from that? I have no place in the kitchen. I don't belong there. I am out of place there. I'm kidding. I, I, I cook at my house. I clean at my house. I help around my house. But I could have definitely taken that in the wrong way. And today, we're going to be talking about the kitchen. Specifically, we're going to be talking about eating and feeding ourselves spiritually. So take your Bibles, Matthew chapter 5, or your apps, whatever you're reading on. Open them up, Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to read verse 6. Now, Matthew chapter 5 is the beginning of Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. And he begins the Sermon on the Mount with what is commonly called the Beatitudes. And this is one of those Beatitudes. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. And Jesus says this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Isn't that cool? If you hunger, if you thirst for righteousness, you will be satisfied as a follower of Christ. Now, it's at this point that I have a confession. I don't know about you, but there are times in my life when I would not characterize my relationship with Christ as hungering for him. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had that place where you're like, you know, I love Jesus, uh, and, and I, have, I follow him, and I, I, I'm there, but I wouldn't classify myself as hungering and thirsting for Christ. I've been there, and there are times that I go through those moments of life where maybe the hunger for Christ is not as strong as it should be. But that's what we're going to be talking about, because I think that in our spiritual lives, we suffer from eating problems. As a matter of fact, I'm going to talk this morning about two eating problems that we tend to suffer from spiritually. So let's look at the first one. The first spiritual eating problem that we have is spiritual starvation. Spiritual starvation. You want to know the secret to this beautiful bikini body that I have? This room just got really awkward. <laughs> I only eat one meal every week. I eat lunch on Monday, and I don't eat any food the rest of the week. Now, is that truth? No, you can tell full on that I'm telling you a lie right now, because physically, it's really not possible to live week and week and week on one meal per week. It's physically impossible to do that, right? Right? But don't we tend to do that to ourselves spiritually? We show up on Sunday morning at 9.30, and we feed ourselves spiritually, and then we go home and we put our Bible down on the shelf, and it sits there until Sunday at 9 a.m. when we go to grab it to come to church again, right? We have a tendency as followers of Christ to starve ourselves spiritually. But is that how God designed us? No. God designed us to be reading, to be investing, to be praying every day, to, to be investing in following him day in and day out. I would not expect myself to be a healthy person if I gorged myself on the best food for one day and then didn't eat the other six days. And so we have to honestly look at ourselves and say, okay, how do I need to not starve myself spiritually anymore, but instead be giving myself the spiritual food outside of this setting right here on Sunday morning so that I can be spiritual healthy all through the week? Because the Bible talks a lot about ingesting God's word and prayer as a spiritual food that makes us healthy. 
the worst part about this is not that we starve ourselves, it's that we tend to starve everyone around us, don't we? Parents, do we starve our children spiritually during the week? Yeah, probably. We're probably all guilty of that to some extent. I would never feed my son one meal during the week and then not feed him the rest of the week. But I can, I'm guilty of doing that spiritually with my own child. And I'm a pastor. And so the fact is, is that we need to not only feed ourselves, but we need to feed our family as well. We need to feed our spouse, our children, our grandchildren, uh, the people that are around us. If you go and read Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 6 tells us that it's not the church's responsibility to teach God's word to our kids. It's our responsibility as parents. And so spiritually feeding our children comes to the parents. It's their responsibility to let their children be spiritually fed all through the week. It's not Miss Julie's responsibility And it's not our youth pastor, Pastor Robert, it's not his responsibility. Although I will tell you, the ministries that we have here for children and for teenagers are excellent. And I'm not just saying that because I'm one of the pastors here. I truly believe we have an excellent children's ministry and an excellent student ministry here. But the fact is, is that those ministries should not be the only way that your children get fed. They should be a supplement to what you're doing at home. And so bring your students, bring your children on Sunday mornings so that they can learn about God, you know, over here or over here. Bring your teenagers on Tuesday or Wednesday night. Middle schoolers meet on Tuesday. High schoolers meet on Wednesday at 6.30 over here in our student room. Bring them and let us help you. But as parents, we're supposed to be feeding and being the primary spiritual influencers for our children. And so... Why do we do this, though? Why do we spiritually starve ourselves and starve our family? Because we don't do it physically. We don't, you know, oh, man, I forgot to eat all day today and yesterday and the day before. That doesn't happen. So why do we do it spiritually? Well, I think there's two reasons why we tend to spiritually starve ourselves. I think the first one is fear. I think there is a tendency inside of us to go, man, if I start talking to my child about God, then they're going to start asking questions. And what if I don't have answers? And, you know, we, we kind of spin into this cycle of fear about feeding our children and talking to our children about Jesus. I think the second thing that makes us spiritually starve ourselves, and this is, I think, the biggest one, is laziness. I think we're lazy. Because spiritually feeding ourselves, does that just kind of happen? Does it just kind of, oh, look, I slipped and fell in God's word and got fed today? No, it's the, if we want to feed ourselves spiritually, we have to do that very intentionally, do, don't we? We have to do it on purpose. But as followers of Christ, as Americans, we've got so many things that distract us from that, don't we? We've got so many other things in our lives that can spiritually distract us, so we end up starving ourselves because we're doing something else, or we just get lazy with it, which actually leads into the second spiritual eating problem. The first one was spiritual starvation. The second one is the plague of putrescence. Ooh, big word. Plague of putrescence. I'll give you a second to write it down. Don't misspell it. You don't want to misspell things. Plague of putrescence. Now, what does putrescence mean? Putrescence is anything that is so rotten or poisoned that it w- if you ate it, it would make you sick or kill you. It's putrid. So the plague of putrescence. Now, when I was a kid, I was allergic to sugar. If I ate a little bit of sugar, it would make me sick. And when I was somewhere around the age of eight, uh, the doctor said, hey, listen, I think he's grown out of that allergy, that, that uh, incapacity to, to eat sugar, so you can start giving him sugar. Shortly after that, my dad and I went on a camping trip with a bunch of buddies of ours. And you know how camping trips go. You, you leave the house, you drive for hours, and the last town you hit before you get to the camping spot, you stop at the grocery store, right? To get all the supplies you need. And so we stopped at the grocery store, and knowing that I could have sugar now, I asked my dad if I could get 
You know those sun-kissed orange drinks, those sodas? Sun-kissed, I don't know what they're actually called, but sun-kissed orange sodas. I asked him to get me some, and he bought me a case of those orange sodas. And so we loaded them up, we get to the camping site, we're unloading everything, and as soon as that case came out, I opened it up, guzzled one down, and before the end of the night, I had drank in five of those orange sodas, enough to probably kill a horse. That's how many I drank. Now, have you ever had one of those things? It's almost like you take a drink, and it's almost like the sugar comes out of the can and punches you across the face. That's how much sugar is in these things. Mind you, my body, for the better part of a decade, has not had sugar. And then I go, and in less than a 12-hour span, I drink five of these sun-kissed orange sodas. By the end of the night, I was behind the bushes throwing up, and I was sick the entire camping trip. I was miserable. I hated that trip because of what I did to myself. And aren't there things spiritually that we kind of let that happen to us? They're not necessarily bad in and of themselves, but when we overindulge in them, they become spiritually putrescent to us. They poison us inside. So let me give you some examples. Television. How many of us have sat down and said, oh, I love this show? And you sit down, you go, I'm going to watch this show because this is my show. And then I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to spend some time in prayer, blah, blah, blah. And five hours later, we're still watching our show, right? Television is one of those things that it's not necessarily bad in and of itself. It's bad when we overindulge in it. It's bad when we spend hours and we neglect God or our family because we're watching the screen. What about our those little rectangular devices that we all have sitting in our back pockets right now or in our purses? You know, how many of us are guilty of coming home at night and pulling that thing out after we've eaten dinner and we do this for three hours? Again, that device, that phone or tablet or whatever it is, I mean, I preach off of one. It's not necessarily bad in and of itself, but it becomes bad when I neglect my family or I neglect growing in God for this. That's when it becomes a problem. What about this one? Let's take a different spin on this. What about work? Is work a bad thing? Some of you might say it is. But is work, is work a bad thing? Not in and of itself. Work is something that is necessary, and many of us enjoy our jobs. But take me, for example. As a pastor, I could easily work 24-7. Uh, there's, that's an easy thing to happen. So if I let work become something that consumes so much of my life and my time that I don't spend time with my wife and my son and I don't spend time talking to God and following God and reading God's word, if I let work take all those things out of my life, work has now become putrescent in my life. It has become a poison to my spiritual well-being. What about busyness? Is busyness a bad thing? No, not in and of itself. It's, it's good to be busy to a certain extent. But parents, how many of us are more glorified taxi cabs to our kids than we are actual living beings sometimes? It, the fact is, is that we as families could easily fill up every minute of every day going to practices and recitals and this thing and that thing with our kids and we fill our day up so much and we fill our week up so much that we don't have time for God anymore and we don't even have time for our kids because we're driving them around but we're not actually spending actual time with them and so busyness being involved in a sport or an activity or a club or whatever with your kids those are not bad things but they can become bad if they consume our life and push out that healthy time with our family and that time with God. So that's the first type of plague of putrescence that we can have in our spiritual life. But there's a second one. The first one, not bad in and of itself, as long as we don't abuse it. The second one is flat out bad even if we have a small amount. There are things that God says 
This is bad even in small doses. They will poison you spiritually. They will poison me spiritually even in tiny amounts because they're dangerous, they're deadly, they're poisonous to our spiritual well-being. Let me give you some examples of, of what I'm talking about. Have you ever opened the fridge and you pull out the milk carton and you undo the lid and you go to pour it and an odor hits your nose and you're like, oh my goodness, honey, come here and smell this. <laughs> Have you ever done that or had somebody do that to you? Or, or take this one, you're sitting eating food and you go, and you spit it out because it's so disgusting and you're like, taste this, it's awful. <laughs> Why do we do that? It's like, a, it's like I'm saying, I love you, share in my misery. It's awful, but we do that, don't we? But if we take that rotten, spoiled milk and I drank a whole glass of it, it's probably going to make me sick. S even small amounts of something that's poisonous can damage us spiritually. And so here's an example. Uncontrolled anger. Uncontrolled anger, even in small amounts, is a spiritual poison. The Bible over and over says it's one thing to have the emotion of anger. That's not a problem. It's how or whether or not we control our anger determines whether it's healthy or not, okay? So uncontrolled anger, those outbursts of anger, are universally condemned by God. We're supposed to have this level of self-control over our anger, but Let's be honest, how many of us struggle with that when we get inside the doors of our house and nobody's watching? That's something I struggle with. It's something that I always have to keep an eye on and monitor because even a little bit of that anger, if I let it into my life, that little bit of anger is going to poison me and it's going to become bigger and bigger and bigger and then it's going to be this huge spiritual sickness that I have. Now, let me take a side note here because I'm sure most of you have seen the news as what's happening in Virginia right now. Let me just jump on a high horse and a soapbox real quick and just say that hatred and fighting in any way, shape, or form like that is not right. Any way that you want to hate someone is a sin. We are all children of God made in His image, and it doesn't matter what the color of our skin is or where we come from, or what our socioeconomic standing is in this society, to hate someone because they are different than you is a sin. It is wrong, it is not right. And this is not about politics. Don't hear me on that. I, I could care less about the politi uh, political stances. My problem is that people are punching other people and running over people with cars because of the hatred they feel in their hearts. That is why it's wrong in any way, shape, or form. Hatred is always putrescent to our souls. It will always rot us from the inside out spiritually. You cannot maintain a healthy relationship with Christ and hate the people around you. Those two things do not equate. It's like you saying, I'm going to go work out every single day, but I'm only going to live on Twinkies and Ho-Hos. <laughs> right? Those things are counterintuitive of one another. You can't do both. You can't hate people and have a healthy relationship with God. It doesn't work that way. So uncontrolled anger. What about this? What about an affair? You know, well, there's that passage in the Bible where it says you can have two affairs and still be in right. No, 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 the Bible doesn't say that. Any form of affairs can be poisonous. Not just can, it will poison our spiritual well-being we are designed by god to be in a marriage relationship and stay faithful to that person and so we're called by god to stay true to that one person what about addictions not just chemical not like alcohol or drugs only but what about addictions to relationships uh, or addictions to codependency or just addictive behaviors those can be poisonous to us as well spiritually. Now here's the thing. I've called out a few things that spiritually will poison us from the inside out, but the beautiful thing about this is God is the perfect 
and holy physician. Not just physically, but spiritually. God has the ability to suck all of that poison that we have in our lives. He has the ability through his Holy Spirit to suck all of that out of our lives if we will take those things to him and begin the process of taking the steps to heal those spiritual poisons that are inside of us. And we've got a couple ways to help you do that, to take those first steps in the healing process. We've got a great ministry here called Celebrate Recovery. And it's a recovery ministry that is designed, we've got a few fans here, it is a ministry that is specifically designed to help you if you're struggling with alcoholism or drug addiction or codependency or any other life issue, that you, just some sin issue that you continually seem to struggle in. If you've got some kind of habit or a hurt or a hang up that you struggle, Celebrate Recovery might be the way that God wants to take you into that next step of healing and redemption in your life. If you have that poison in your spirit, Celebrate Recovery may be a ministry that can help God begin the process of cleaning that poison out of your spirit. We also offer counseling. So if you need to talk with someone one-on-one, we have counselors available to talk with you and help you grow spiritually and get through those spiritual issues that may be poisoning you. So, I've mentioned two spiritual eating problems, spiritual starvation and the plague of putrescence. But how do we counteract those eating problems? What can we do spiritually to not starve ourselves spiritually? And what can we do spiritually to not be ingesting poisons? How can we have holy healthiness? Holy healthiness. How does that come about? What can we do? How many of you have ever gone on a diet? Pretty much everyone in the room, probably, if I was to guess. To some extent or another, even if it was something that the doctor said you needed to do. Maybe you have a heart condition or a kidney disorder or something like that, and the doctor says, you need to avoid these kinds of foods, and you need to eat more of these kinds of foods, right? Have you ever noticed the first three letters of diet are die? But in reality, I joke, but in reality, there are some diets that are really good for us, right? I mean, if we eat our serving of vegetables every single day, of fruit and vegetables, is that going to be good for us physically? Absolutely. It's going to be great for us. So there are things that Christ says we should invest in spiritually to give us this holy healthiness. So I'm not a baker, I will confess that right now. I do not bake things. Unless it comes in a box, um, it's not going to happen with me. My wife is the baker. Um, She bakes. I tend to cook the carcasses of dead animals in a smoker. That's my thing. But the fact is, is that, and it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, when you bake, you kind of have to have certain ingredients at just the right portions, right? Uh, When I'm smoking a meat, I can just put the dry rub all over and it doesn't matter how much I use or not use, it's still gonna come out delicious. But if I'm baking a cake, I can't skip on the flour, right? I can't skip on, again, I'm shooting in the dark here because I'm not a baker. The milk, is there milk in cake? Some of you are shaking your head, or water or milk or something, okay. Um, I can't not put in an egg. Is that right? Okay. If I want that cake to taste good, I need to put some kind of sugar or something like that in it, correct? There are certain things that I need to make that cake turn out right. Spiritually, there are things that we need across the board in order to be spiritually healthy, to have holy healthiness. Now, there is no magic formula that is universal and perfect for every person in this room. Well, if you take three cups of God's word and pour it in, and then you take two cups of prayer and put that in, and then you take a dash of this and a dash of that, that's not how our spirits work. That's not how following Christ works. But there are things that Christ says, you do have to have this in that recipe in order for that healthiness to be there. So let me look at a few of these first. The first one is God's word. If you want to have holy healthiness, you have to be reading 
and thinking and meditating on God's word. I mentioned earlier Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6 is this beautiful passage about instructions for following God for the family unit. And, and it basically says, know God's word, meditate on it day and night, write it on your doorpost, write it on your forehead, and talk about it with your children all the time. That's the Chad translation, the OC translation of Deuteronomy 6, the first few verses. The idea here is that God tells us in Deuteronomy 6 that an understanding and a meditation, in other words, thinking about God's word and what it says, brings us holy healthiness. It brings us that spiritual health that we all need. But in that, we also have to apply it, right? So that's the second thing. It's not just knowing God's word. We have to do what it says. Because what's the point if we know it and don't do it? That, uh, that makes no sense. And so we need to continually be applying God's word to our own personal lives. Uh, next, we need to pray. And I've mentioned this several times this morning. Prayer is that personal connection with Christ. You know, I, I've got a, a friend that I talk to, I text, you know, about once a week. And we have a great friendship. But if I did not speak to him for two years, our friendship would suffer. Because we're not communicating. And prayer does that with, uh, with us and God. It keeps that connection, that, that uh, relationship that we have with God healthy. And then lastly, in order to have that holy healthiness, we need to be connected to a body of Christ. Now, there's this myth out there that I can be a Christian and I don't have to go to church. I can do, I can do the whole Christian thing without going to church. That is probably the greatest Satan-filled lie that probably the American culture has ever been bombarded with. Because God's word over and over tells us that if we're not connected to a body of Christ, we will not be able to achieve spiritual healthiness. Uh, go read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as a great example. It talks about the body of Christ and that any body, the physical body, is great as long as all the parts are working together. But if I'm the finger in the body of Christ, and I say, you know what, I don't need the body, I'm good, and I sever myself from the body, am I going to be able to survive apart from the greater body? No. The fact of the matter is, is God designed us to be invested into a body of Christ. Now, I've talked about these things that bring us this holy healthiness, but how can we help you with that here at Calvary? Well, in your sermon notes, you've got references to things that can help you at home. So one of the things is Right Now Media. Right Now Media, if you weren't here last week, it is an online video library, kind of like Netflix for church. And Calvary has a subscription, and it is completely free to you. There are over 10,000 video programs on the, in this library. And it ranges in subjects, everything from just basic uh, growing in Christ to parenting to marriage to men, women. They've got a whole section that's uh, designed for kids and has kids' cartoons that are spiritually focused. I mean, it's got a little of everything in it. And if you want to be a part of this video library, if you want to have access, all you have to do is email our church office, office at calvarylhc.com, and ask for permission, and we will send you the login information. It's free to you. There's no obligation. The second thing is parentq.com. Now, this is a program that we use in our children's ministries, your, where your kids are checked in right now. It is a week-long program that gives you questions and answers to talk with your children about that's tied to what they're hearing in the classroom at this very moment. And so if you've got questions about that, go see Miss Julie over in the early childhood wing, and she'd be glad to connect you with it and explain to you how that works. The big one, though, here at Calvary is life groups. Life groups are our small group ministry here at Calvary. And our small group ministry, our life group ministry, uh, our signups for that start on Labor Day weekend, uh, just a few weeks from now. And so if you're not connected to a life group, I would encourage you to think about that and pray about that and check it out on our website and get signed up uh, when those signups start on Labor Day weekend. Because in reality, life change through Jesus Christ happens best when you're connected with a group of believers, a small group of believers. 
And so we want you to connect to our life group ministry because that's the way to grow in Christ day in and day out. Lastly, Christ tells us to go serve him. And we've got opportunities across the board for you to serve Christ here at Calvary. Great example is we've got uh, on October 7th, we're going to go do 10, at least 10 projects at every single school in Lake Havasu City on those, that day. In other words, we're going to paint, we're going to do repair work, we're going to fix those schools up, and we need help to do that. We want you to set that day aside so that you can go to a school and help give back for this, what the schools do, do for our community. But maybe you're going, yeah, but I can't physically do that kind of stuff. We need help in our children's ministry. We would love to have you come and volunteer and help teach kids about Jesus, even if it was one weekend a month. We need help with our youth ministry. We need help with men's. If there's an interest that you have and you want to get connected, we can connect you to serve Christ in some way, form, or fashion. So here's my closing question for you. How are you suffering from spiritual starvation or the plague of putrescence? What, what effects are those two things having in your life? And what changes do you need to make to have holy healthiness?